And as usual, uh, while we're waiting, if folks have things they want to add onto the agenda, currently it's pretty sparse. And again, while people are joining, I figure I could just call out, we talked about um, Contrib at our last meeting and Matt had a proposal that he sent out to the various Envoy mailing lists. So if you're not on Envoy Dev or Envoy users, you can sign up, but the doc is there either way. Yeah, it would be great if people could look at that. I'm actually probably gonna start implementing it later this week. Um, I have gotten some comments, but it seems like there's generally consensus, but speak up now, please. <laughs> so should we talk our back? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. We'll probably start my video. All right. Um, I had a brief conversation with Greg about this and I thought I'll get some consensus about how to go about this. The problem you're trying to solve is how do we do our back on dynamically uh, resolved um, domains. So for example, uh, we will, right now our back seems to be possible on uh, ingress slash um, downstream uh, information, but not much on upstream. So we want to be able to solve the problem where they're trying to say, hey, we want to uh, apply some policies on outgoing uh, domains or, or dynamically resolved IP addresses. So um, had some conversation with Greg and uh, Greg had ideas uh, like, you know, for example, we could write a probably uh, a um, upstream filter, um, but uh, that's, that's one idea um, and um, I was just thinking, like, is there any other um, ways or possibilities to do this? I began, um, I began a uh, a proposal uh, uh, on one of the issues uh, as an issue, and then I had some ideas about it uh, for spe specific case of dynamic forward proxying. But I don't know if that's going to work for all the cases. For the generic case of having a um, a uh, any any uh, cluster which has to dynamically resolve its domains. Uh, uh, the RBAC filter doesn't have that information uh, uh, at when uh, when the data passes through it. Uh, so that's the problem uh, I think we are trying to solve here. And I thought if you had any ideas. Yeah, and so when we were talking about this, uh, I have never looked closely at how the dynamic forward proxy even works. So uh, <laughs> I pretty quickly got to the end of my knowledge on that and uh, and just said we should discuss it uh, with people who know that area better. Yeah, so one thing I, I, I meant to ask on the issue and I want to understand a little bit better is, do you actually want to block by IP insider range or is it okay to just block based on the host that they're trying to reach? Because I, I think there's a pretty big difference in how complex it's going to be right so both <laughs> so yes <laughs> so yeah i think for domain i think we have a way because you know like for http uh the host or authority would uh, help us do that as, as part of the http header um uh, but it's the problem is when we want to do it uh, dynamically when um, it's it resolves to a pseudo range which we want to block um so that's the problem which i think a little bit gnarly i guess <clears throat> yeah I guess one follow-up question there is if if it resolves to multiple IPs and one of them is bad, are you okay connecting to the other ones, or is it that you would want to block anything where where block the host anything. resolves to one block of the addresses? Anything. Yeah, block anything is the current idea, not uh, so anything. If, uh... if the RBAC filter runs after the DFP filter, and I think I had just written that into a GitHub 
comment this morning, I, I don't, I, I think it's pretty easily doable, right? Because I don't think there's any requirement. I don't think there's any requirement. Today, requir yes. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. You, you can finish. Sorry. I was just going to say that uh, apart from any problem that Alyssa is about to bring up, I think if you run <laughs> the RBAC filter after the DFP filter, when the DFP filter runs, we can just get the resolved host information into stream info and then have the right RBAC matchers on that. Right. So, I, I mean, that seems fairly straightforward to me. I'm not sure what, what problems Alyssa is referring to. Yeah, so right, right now, as Matt says, you can do that. And because DNS resolution is functionally synchronous, what would happen is you'd resolve DNS, DFP blocks until then. And right. then after the DNS resolution happened, our back would run and you could say, okay, what, what did this actually resolve to? Do I want to block right. it or not? Absolutely. Um, when, D when DNS resolution gets asynchronous, that gets more complicated because it's going to be right. doing updates. Um, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to block, um, we don't want to block connecting if like we've gotten a V4 resolution and V6 is pending. Right. But, right. but with happy eyeballs, we might want to try both. Right. So I think we're going to have to add some extra hooks and that can be, that can be on our site since uh, if you get there first. Um, for happy eyeballs, making sure that the RBAC filter has hooks to say, okay, I've now gotten a secondary resolution and that's in the bad ranges. You know, wh what do I want to do at this point? Do I want to cancel the request or, or what have you? Right. Uh, I think uh, referring to what Matt was saying, at, um, the proposal, I think he might be referring to the proposal I had put yesterday um, and as one of the issues. As, uh, and I said, hey, this is possible for a dynamic uh, forward proxy because of the way it is architected. You know, it waits for um, uh, for the to be resolved, and then there is a virtual DNS uh, only one IP address to be resolved. So, so all that works great. It's only the case like what Alisa is mentioning, which is for the for the dynamic case where it is not a, it is not um, uh, where the filters are not waiting for to be resolved. It's as asynchronously happening. That's a problem. I think. It's a little bit more gnarly, and I was thinking, how do we solve that? You know, so um, I guess um, I'm happy to hear uh, ideas here. My my personal advice is to not worry about that right now for two reasons. One, I, I, I think you could get something working right now, and it would be pretty clean, and I think it would work for other people. Um, so I, I would recommend that you just get the solution working where RBAC runs after DFP and we can look in stream info. The problem that Alyssa is talking about is very real, but to be honest, we have a lot of other stuff to figure out there because if just, just the way that the filter stack works today is it's basically synchronous and then we move to the next filter and then the router sets up connections. So, uh, you know, I, I agree that in the future, we probably have to handle the case where maybe we get a V4 resolution and then we get a V6 resolution. But at that point, we would have already moved to the router and beyond our back. So, you know, then might, maybe we need a hook and we have to get rid of the connection right away or something. My, my personal opinion is that for your case, I, I probably not worry about that right now, but maybe Alyssa feels differently. What happens if we get back multiple IPs from DNS in the initial response? So the way that it currently works in DFP is that it will, I actually need to check, I believe today, and there's actually an open issue on this. So DFP works like the logical DNS cluster. It'll only pick one. Oh, there okay. are open bugs where people actually want it to work more like strict DNS, where it'll take all the IPs That's and right. then it'll you know pick it and load balance or whatever. Um, that's not implemented today. So so today there's a single resolution. It'll basically jam the IP address into the cluster, and when you advance beyond DFP, you're guaranteed that that's the IP address that you're going to connect okay. to. Yeah. So so like the other thing that Alyssa said that might change in the future, but it's the way that it works right now. So my adv advice again is that I think you can unblock your existing use case very easily. And I would, I, I don't see a lot of downside in doing that. And then I think as we implement the stuff that Alyssa is talking about, which is very complicated, or if we move to strict DNS, I, I feel like we can revisit that. Well, Matt, if there's, a, if there's a resolution change in a retry, I think it could still be a problem today, couldn't it? I don't think so because the way that it works, so I'd, I'd have to go look at the code, but the way that it works today, oh, actually you might be right. I'm not sure. 
Like what if there's and, another filter in the chain that blocks? And so there's some time that elapses after we've done our back. Could the resolution right. change? I think, I think Alyssa is right that again, I'd have to look because I think that if the resolution is async and it updates it, it could update the cluster. And then when it goes to retry and picks a new host, it would be the right. new IP address. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think what Matt says, will get you 80% of the way there. Yeah, and then that's true. what we need to do is add the hooks that we need to add for happy eyeballs anyway, to say when the resolution change, have our back notified so that yeah. our back can say like, now I want to kill this connection. Yeah. Like I change one end. I want to, I want to remove it. <sighs> Yeah, that's a tough and one. We can, we can help out with that because Ryan Ryan and David have been looking a lot about the DNS resolution. So like, we'd be happy to coordinate either right. here or, or again, we can just meet up offline. The weird thing is that the, the pick happens after RBAC runs. And so if there's ever, I mean, that that's, seems like a fundamental mismatch in that we haven't it, called pick yet. So how, how can we promise to RBAC that this is what we're picking? It, because in the case where it doesn't change and we use the logical DNS, you're guaranteed that it will be that yeah. IP address. Lar um, largely, it should be an upstream filter so that every time we do a retry, get invoked again, and we don't have upstream filters yet. So like, correct. we can get 90% of the way there. We can <laughs> close that gap on the callback. But just a great point, we noticed this in various security incidents. There's an issue that there's basically our back is badly defined. We, we, and particularly when we look like pathways and routes is cluster picking basically replicate logic that takes place during route picking and custom and, and anyone who's, who's actually like policy has to do this in two places um, which haven't always been considered ideally what you would do is the right policy on the service and in this particular case that's not really the for places where you are actually potentially clusters with our back policy. Today, there's not a Whereas if we did have the upstream filter here, we would have and, and And that's kind of what I was gonna say is that we keep coming back to the fact that we have upstream network filters today. We don't have upstream HTTP filters. I think we just need to finish upstream HTTP filters because there's just too many cases in which this comes up. So, I, I, I guess, I guess I, I haven't really changed my opinion, which is that depending on your use case and how you've configured retries and a bunch of other things, I think like Alyssa says, you can get 80 to 100% there based on your config. And you could probably start there. And, and any code that you write in terms of a new RBAC rule to look in stream info could apply to when we install RBAC as an upstream HTTP filter, most, most likely. So, I would, so, I would at least want you. it. I, I would at least want really heavy commenting about the limitations because I think sure. yeah. with the race condition that Greg said, if there's th that that you could have a synchronous issue without retries too, and that would sure. that would kind of be a bummer. And most people probably like. Th this is why I was wondering if blocking on host is enough, right? Because like, how often are you going to want to block an IP range for an endpoint, but not care if it resolves somewhere else? Like, I'm not sure what the use case would be there. Yep. Of like, I want to block Google if it resolved to address A, but not address B. Like, uh, but there are there's, use cases where it's like there's like there's like feeds of like problematic IP addresses which people just want to block on, and that's their like their their security requirements. Yeah. So, uh, well, could we could we do upstream network filter for that? I mean, if it's pure IP address. You you probably could. You just probably wouldn't get the response codes that 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 you might like, but that would be one option. The other option that I'm just going to throw out there that you can think about is that. <clears throat> so the way that it works today is DFP is coupled with the DFP cluster. One option that we could do, and you'd have to investigate how complicated this is, is that you could couple DFP with, with the original DST filter. And basically what that would do is you would lock the IP address at the time that the, that the DFP filter runs. And even if it retries, you would lock it to running, what if, to targeting the same idea. IP address. Yeah. What, what if this was doing it with the DFP filter and we did it on the DNS resolution and just said like we don't we don't want to give these addresses to hosts? Like we basically had pluggable pluggable actions on DNS resolution. That would be fine too. I mean it's like we can 
I'm just saying there, there are other ways with changes to the DFP filter in terms of either locking the IP address or having, uh, you know, additional RBAC policies. My only concern with that one, Alyssa, is that then we wind up in the situation, which we've had in the past, like Harvey said, where we have multiple ways of doing RBAC and there's bugs and, uh, you know, so yeah. that, that, that feels- Yeah, at the end of the day, we want a stream network. Right. To be it feels- We all know that. Yeah, it feels a bit worse to me. So I would say that I'd probably look at one of two things. One of them is I, I would either fund finishing upstream HTTP filters. You can sync up with Snow offline. He's done a lot of the plumbing work there. So it's not like you're starting from scratch. Someone just got to finish it. Um, or like Alyssa was saying, or I was saying, I think we could have an optional configuration in DFP where the selected IP address gets locked to the, to the request um, and then we don't allow it to change. And I don't think that would be that hard to implement either. And then you'd be guaranteed that when you run the RBAC filter after it, it'll check it and the IP address for the lifetime of that request will never what, change. What would then happen if you, if you use this new RBAC filter you know, mode on with some other set of filter chains, something, you know, just normal uh, routing as opposed to dynamic forward. I, I'm concerned that we're adding a security related feature with an enormous foot gun uh, and people are gonna screw this up and think that something is secure. And then they didn't read the, the attention block in the doc saying, don't do this because I don't know. No, sorry. I'm. I'm agreeing with Alyssa, which is that I, I don't think we should implement something that has the foot gun risk. So I okay. take it back about the 80 okay. or 90% solution. Okay. I'm just saying that I think if you want to fix something right now without doing um, the upstream HTTP filters, I think we could add a feature or a functionality to and configure in a way where we know that it'll work correctly or whatever. I'm not sure of the details, but I think you could lock the IP address. So basically it can't change. And then at that point, even in the face of retries, you'd be going to IP foo and you could block it or not. And you would know for the lifetime of that request that IP foo would, would never change. But are you saying still do it with an RBAC rule? on the downstream HTTP filter? Yeah, I would still run RBAC after DFP. Right. And, and, well, and I guess no... I'm concerned about if we add that filter rule to RBAC that someone will use it with not the dynamic forward proxy where we have no idea what the, the upstream is at the time right. evaluated. Sure. Um, I mean, we'd have to go look at the details. I'm going to be honest. I don't know. I just, I feel like today there's a lot of foot gun risk today, right? It's like people use IP tagging filter with the RBAC filter. I don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's, I feel like this is a giant minefield that leads to both CVEs and other internal problems all, all the time. But I don't, I guess I don't know quickly how to fix that, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't know. Snow, can you comment on how much work you think there was left on upstream filters? There's probably quite a bit. So the work I did was to extract out the filter manager from the HCM. And then I tried to do the work to, so I, I had a branch PR where I had it working using it for the router. Um, and so it's basically probably taking that over or like finalizing it. The difficulty was in having like a nice way to like runtime guard it because we it's fairly big change. Um, and then that was just bringing it into the router and then there's work around making the, them actually configurable. Um, and probably some, I, I recall there being some like um, uncertainties around exactly how it fit in with host selection and retries and whatnot. Um, so probably just like a, a few open questions there exactly or like where they run and whatnot, but um, all like fairly like well known, but I think it's, it'll be like, it'll be a bit of work uh, just, just to get it all um, fitting nicely together and runtime guarding and testing and, and all that. Yeah, and we probably need to even think about whether we wanted to run as part of the router or in the upstream request abstraction that wraps around the com pool. I mean, there's like yeah, there's exactly. a bunch of places that we could think about that may be more or less risky. 
it's certainly a scary change. It's just, this comes up all the time. And I feel like we just, we just have to do it. Um, I would be willing to take this on as one of my, you know, difficult side projects, but at the rate that I'm able to deliver difficult side projects, I don't know when, <laughs> when that would actually happen. Fair enough. Thank, thanks a lot, guys. I think uh, what I'm hearing is, I think for us, most um, like uh, Matt and uh, Matt suggested, I think 90% of the cases should be solved by, um, by applying the simple um, dynamic proxy based uh, and the stream info based solution. Um, I think, uh, but, but the other, other case is coming soon. So I think I'll probably sync up with all of you guys again when it comes. Yeah, thanks a lot. I would. I would recommend looking at the code and maybe just working with Greg a bit offline. I don't think it'll take that much. And Greg, I can help you with pointers too, if you want. Um, but I would at least scope out what it would look like to lock the IP address. Because I think if we did that, that's a reasonable solution that would also help with Alyssa's case, um, where like, you know, maybe you get later resolutions, but you could ignore them if the IP address is locked or something like that. I mean, again, we'd have to think through this. Like it wouldn't be <clears throat> optimal from a performance standpoint, but it would it would work, I think. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Anything else folks want to chat about? I think that was it for the agenda. Um, I, I, I guess we could briefly talk about the Windows socket issue. I, I, I don't know who's on the call right now, but it came to our attention yesterday that my reuse port change basically broke Windows when concurrency is greater than one. <laughs> uh, oh. So we need to we need to figure that out. Yeah, I'm here. So, um, yeah, basically when we duplicate the socket, um, the problem is that if we duplicate the socket at any point before we listen to the socket, uh, then we can't accept any calls. We can't bind the socket. We can't, uh, we can't listen to the duplicate socket again. Uh, so I mean, this, this is what I've been, this is what I've been trying left and right. And th th this is what I've been trying and I'm getting failure. So I'm not quite sure what the solution is to be honest. Let me, let me just ask you one question for my understanding on, on windows is the broken sequence basically that you, <clears throat> you create a socket, you bind it, then you duplicate it. Then at that point, accept calls fail right? If you create a socket, duplicate them all, then bind them all, I would that work? That. I tried that. No, no, no. I tried that and that doesn't work. You have to, you have to duplicate after you listen. Uh, oh, quite arguably a Windows bug, uh, quite arguably a Windows bug. Uh, and we've been discussing this internally, whether how we can fix it and, you know, to ask this internally. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is, you know, even okay. Windows release and how long this is gonna take. I'm yeah. Not sure what's, okay. Uh, what's yeah. The, the solution. I don't. I don't want to bother everyone on this call. Why don't Why don't you and I chat after this meeting and let's let's do some brainstorming. The The problem sure. is is that like I mentioned to you, that change was really hairy and it was done for a bunch of reasons and like unwinding that change. I mean, it's ugh, it's it just sounds awful. So I'm not uh, on on yeah. Windows. Could we? Is it possible to not duplicate this? Oh no, because then you close it. Because, too. well, so on Windows, what we did, so so one option on Windows is for now, we could just turn reuse port on on Windows, even though the functionality is undetermined, right? right. Because, because that would fix this problem, fix it in quotes. That would um, probably send all the connections to one worker. I don't know. I actually think on Windows, we don't, we don't know what the behavior is and that's why we turned it off. Okay. Um, I don't think that's the behavior because the tests were not failing on Windows like they were on Mac. Right. So, so that would be one option is what is the functionality on Windows if reuse port is on, or I think in Windows it's called reuse address. Um, and we could flip it so that on Windows, we actually turn it on well, until, so. you know, until the underlying issue is fixed. I just, if we, 
if we have to go back to the case where we duplicate after so so you're saying that the old code on windows i'm trying to remember now we basically no on the old code we listened on each worker right so you're saying that we can't listen on any socket until we've duplicated them all like is that is that the problem yeah we need to duplicate we need to listen on the first socket listen on the on the socket of worker zero and then start duplicating the socket and then pass it to all the workers I see. So basically on the old code, because we lost the error handling on listen, the second listens were failing, but the, but it still worked, right? Because like it was basically ignored. Is that is that right? Yeah. And I think like uh, okay. the, the, the worker zero just did all the work and all the tests were passing because the worker zero was just do, was doing the work. No, no, no. Right. But on the old code, before my reuse port change, the way that the sequence was, is that we would make a socket on each worker, we would duplicate it, and then we would listen on that worker, right? So, so we would listen on, on each worker. Did the old code used to work? I mean, it's like, because the listen, was the listen failing on the old code too? Like, I, I think that actually might be worth checking. I, ha I haven't checked that, but I'll have to. I'll okay, have to let's, let's, let's actually talk offline because we're basically out of time because I'm actually now not even convinced that the old code worked, um, which obviously puts us in a really horrible place. Yeah, could be. I, 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 okay. I'll, have, I'll have to check that before the change. Okay. okay. All right. Um, sorry for boring you all with that. Well, and there was one relevant question about the general policy for breaking changes on main which I just noted generally we just roll them back. And I think Matt said specifically you prefer not to on this change because it's- I mean, it's this uh, this one is, is so hairy and there've already been merge conflicts. I, I let's, let's go back because I'm not actually convinced that the old code worked correctly on Windows. So let's, let's, let, let's go and actually check that and then we can figure out the right path forward. Like I, I'm fully on board. I'm not, you know, we can't break Windows. So if we have to roll back, we can, um, but I want to make sure that we know what we're dealing with. Okay, sure. Yep. Also, sorry to uh, take a, a couple of minutes there, uh, a couple of minutes here. The the breaking policy change, we, we actually, we don't seem to be always reverting. And uh, like with one of the changes that happened recently, there was a breaking change that was actually an attempt was to fix on main instead of revert. And then both, you know, the, the original change and an attempted fix were reverted. So what it created is what, what it caused us is to import a tainted commit range internally. And it actually seeped into, not quite into production, but it actually went quite a long way. And there is no way for us to detect the cases where we actually have a tainted commit range. Was that my, uh, my pool uh, cleanup PR? Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think we probably need to be stricter about that if there is a breaking change, we don't try to fix it. We actually first revert it because that we can detect them. We can say we're not going to, you know, we're going to import this as a single chunk so that we don't end up, you know, tainting internal what builds. The, what, what, but, uh, but even then, Jan, we could have tainted because if we... Uh, what, what the risk is there. Yeah, I don't. I don't think in this case, Jan, it would have mattered. But we still could have. We still could have pulled an import with the original chain, right? Like, if we'd done the original change and immediately rolled back, we still could have had a bad merge. I mean, it was it was broken longer because we tried to fix it rather than rolling back. Well, I mean, it was broken for an hour longer, but it had already been a day. Right, right. So that's my point. Is that yeah. I don't think this actually makes the import situation worse. I think that, in general, it's better to, to roll back and roll forward. But again, for really complicated changes. We tend to evaluate risk of, of doing the rollback and having to do all the double. Uh, it, it would have made it better if we did the revert because we don't import, you know, anything that's um, more recent than seven days because we have that seven day window. And before we import, we can actually look ahead and say, was any of the commits with the, we're about to import reverted? And right now, the only way we can detect this is by looking at the commit message. Uh, you know, when you revert it, it, would, it puts a revert word. So we can actually detect that we are about to import something that has been reverted, you know, on main. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we are delayed by seven days, that gives us that, you know, that window of safety. Uh, but if, if we have no way to detect that something was reverted, like in this case, then the system breaks down. 
Oh, was it was it that when we did the revert, the two reverted in one PR, so it 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 fooled the tooling? No, we couldn't detect the one they, that's the original. That we couldn't detect the PR that just attempted to fix the broken commit. Okay, but if we discovered the issue the day later, would we still have the same problem that there would have been a bug at head and no import? And no rollback? Yeah, we could. Uh, well, let me go back and look at it. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the point still stands, right? In this case, we did a revert of both. Mm -hmm. But if we do a you know a bad commit and then we just fix it, then we cannot detect this. And in this case, we can import a tainted commit. And by tainted, you mean something with a known bug? Yes. It, yes. Not, yeah. Okay. I, I I can file an issue. If it's hard to parse right now, I can file an issue upstream uh, and we can discuss it there. We're also out of time. Yeah, yeah, we are over. Oopsie, folks. Next meeting. All right.